Morning, church. <laughs> um, man, that song, <clears throat> that song blew me away. Uh, but it's true, right? Um, our, our arms, uh, you know, the arms of our heart, the inner being, the innermost person of who we are needs to be open to Christ. And, uh, you know, I don't know what you've come in this morning with. I don't know what burdens. I don't know what anxieties. I don't know what pain. I don't know what concerns you came in with. Or, or maybe you're just on cloud nine and, and, and you're praising God. I, I, I hope and I, my prayer is that even in the difficulties of life, you're still praising the Lord through yeah. the circumstances that you've gone through. Um, you know, for me personally, I, I've been encouraged this week. I've been learning a whole lot in the Lord. It was also super tough, man. It was also just a hard week and a painful week and, uh, you know, even agonizing at times. But through it all, uh, you know, the Lord is, is, is great and he's good all the time. God is good. Um, yesterday or last Sunday when, when we were going to leave service, um, you know, I noticed that there was this homeless person out there. And, uh, you know, they kind of been there the last couple of weeks. And I seen I saw her, um, you know, asking people for money at the pump and. You know, uh, it was, again, one of those situations where the Lord's like, OK, you know, there's someone in need. What are you going to do? And so, you know, I walked over to her and, um, you know, talked to her, introduced myself. And I didn't have any cash on me, but I said, hey, you know, we got a church right here. I said, we got a bunch of waters. We got food, this and that. Are you hungry? You want some grapes? You want some muffins? So I gave her some waters, gave her some food and, um, you know, asked her if she wanted prayer. And I told her, you know, you could come anytime you want. 1030 in the morning. Church is going on. And, um. And then I came back in and then told my son, and he's like, oh, I want to give her some money. So we scraped together some money. I think we scraped together like $10 or something. And we gave her some money on the way out, gave her some more food, gave her some utensils. And uh, I saw her again this morning. Her name is Regina. So keep her in prayer. I saw her. I said, hey, 1030, we're on. So why don't you come over and come hang out, man? I got a chair for you right in the front. And uh, she said, you know, thank you. God bless you. So, you know, she's not here, but keep her in your prayers. And then there was another gentleman, a gentleman named Javier that I met this morning. And I've been challenged because I got a text from one of my, my one of my uh, one of the older gentlemen that, uh, you know, stays in contact with me throughout the years. And he sent me some and this week and it said, go to the window wherever you're at and look out the window. You see the cars passing by. You see the people passing by walking. He said, does your heart break for all those people? And I had to be honest with myself. And I was like, man, Lord, you know, sometimes I, I pick and choose who I share the gospel with. And that was just sad because it's like, I don't want to be that person that when I go before the Lord, he's like, all of your works are going to burn up like shaft because it wasn't, you didn't do all you could. Schindler's List. How, how many guys, how many of you have seen that movie? Schindler's List. What was so pivotal at the end of that movie? All the Jewish people, he saved hundreds of Jewish people and they came up to him and they were thanking him and they, or they, there was a letter that was written to him and, and thanking him for what he did. And his whole thing was, I could have done more. I could have saved more if I wouldn't have kept this limousine, if I would have had my, my mind fixed on what, what was really of importance. And that's what I've been challenged with this whole week. Do I really, am I really concerned about every single person I come into contact with? Every person. Because it's that important. It's that important. And I was challenged this week, too. We had a situation at home, and, you know, we found out Sunday night, Tears had lice. Like, lice? Okay. All right. <laughs> and, you know, if you've ever had lice or had children with lice, you know how that goes. And the painstaking uh, task of literally cleaning and laundrying and drying and, and, and vacuuming every single thing. Whatever can't get clean, you get the rubbing alcohol out with spray and you're spraying down every single thing. And, you know, Veronica did like four hours of laundry one night and every day it's like you got to wash their hair for two minutes and you got to take it out. Then you got to wash it again for three minutes. Then you got to get them cleaned up and then you got to go back and you're vacuuming every single thing that they touched and, you know, vacuuming the, the, the bed, the, the mattresses, the pillows. And, you know, there was a moment in that time. And this is we've been doing this every day since Sunday. And some days it's 10 o'clock at night washing tears his hair because I, you know, I just don't, you know, we got stuff we got to do and we can't get to it till then. And there was a point in time where you know, I was, a, I was about to break down and I just was tired and I sensed in my spirit, I was getting bitter 
and I was getting angry and I was getting upset. And I'm like, Lord, I'm tired. I'm tired. But, you know, what is love? <laughs> love is doing things when you don't feel like doing it. That's, that's biblical love. Jesus didn't feel like going to the cross and being crucified, being nailed to a tree, blood gushing out of him, being, being mocked, being scorched, having his beard torn out, being, being you know, treated less than a human being. But yet he loved. For God so loved. That's a selfless kind of love. And that's what the Lord reminded me. And then I started vacuuming harder <laughs> and, 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 and putting more effort into it. And started to get joy out of it despite the difficult circumstance. And, 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 and I was reminded of this verse, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we don't give up. I, I share that with you this morning because I don't know where you're at. And I don't know what you've been trudging through this week where you're like, man, Lord, I'm tired and this is painful and this is challenging and you're stretching me. But don't grow weary in doing good. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you're going to prevail. You're going to reap a bountiful harvest of fellowship with him, really. That's what it's about. It's just growing in maturation with him to where it don't matter what you're going through. You'll be on your deathbed and you'll, your face will be shining so much of the glow of God because you're so close to being in his ultimate presence of, you know, unhindered by the physical body that you're just going to radiate the goodness and the joy of the Lord and the peace of God. That's what we need. That's what I need. And so, uh, again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. I'm very uh, excited this morning. I've been praying about it. As you know, we finished the book of Obadiah last week. And I'm like, all right, Lord, where are we at? And I, and, and I, just, I was just like, I know for a fact, Lord, we're going into Jeremiah. <laughs> and he's like, stop. And I'm like, oh, okay, we're going into the book of Joel. He's like, stop. Then I'm like, man, Lord, am I even hearing for you? I feel like I'm just like playing, you know, Wheel of Fortune, and I'm just kind of just randomly picking and choosing. And no, I heard clearly from the Lord. And so with that, what I sensed in my spirit witnessing to what the Holy Spirit showed me, we're, we're entering into the book of Ecclesiastes. That's where we're at. That's what we're going to get into. And uh, we're, we're going to camp out here for however long we need to camp out. But this morning is all about an introduction to this book. And uh, what goes on in, in this book. So with that, uh, again, when, when we kind of introduce books, it's a little different than our typical week to week, verse by verse, uh, you know, studies throughout the book. I'm just going to give an overview of the book this morning. So I'll start with this. The meaning, the meaning of Ecclesiastes. So this word, it's derivative of a, of a Greek word, meaning a person addressing an assembly or a group of people. And what we would commonly today call a preacher or a pastor. Many of the translations say preacher. They're referring to uh, the person who was inspired by the Holy Spirit used to pen this book. And the timeline uh, for the writing of this book, many Bible scholars believe that this book, the book of Ecclesiastes, was written in approximately 935 B.C. during the end of King Solomon's reign. But before we go any further, let me go ahead and pray. <laughs> Father God, we, we just thank you again for the opportunity to, uh, to get into your word this morning, to hear clearly from you. We pray that you would uh, bless us with your anointing and your favor. Give us your, your love and your, your wisdom. And um, may your favor rest upon us that we would be able to rightly divide your word. Uh, please fill us fresh with the Holy Spirit. Empty us of ourselves and help us to be sensitive to the, to the Holy Spirit to your presence and what you're trying to reveal to us, Lord. Show us the, the, the meaning of, of the scriptures this morning and how they are so applicable to our lives. Show us where Christ is, the center of this book, as all scripture is. And again, give us inspiration. Give us the authority to exercise your word and to share it with those around us. So once again, I pray that every word that's said and spoken of is inspired by the Holy Spirit and not by man. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
All right. So, uh, like I said, uh, we kind of talked about what the meaning of Ecclesiastes is. Okay, basically a meeting, gathering of an assembly, and it, it has to do with the, you know, uh, the individual or the person that's that's called to share information to the assembly and um, the author of the book. So it's not directly identified, right? It's one of those books where it's not plainly, you know, clear to see who wrote the book. We know that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And there are quite a few verses that point to Solomon, King Solomon, uh, King David's son, as the author of this book. And there are some clues in the context that that could suggest that uh, a different person continue writing the book of Ecclesiastes after Solomon's death, possibly several hundred years later. Still, the common belief is the author is uh, believed to be Solomon. King Solomon was the author of this book. What's the purpose of the writing? Right? We all want to know the purpose. What was the intent of this book? Well, this book is a book about perspective. And, and, and I believe we, 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 we teach this, we preach this in this church that it is all about perspective. Do you have a biblical worldview? If your worldview is based on what the precepts of the Bible have to say, it's going to be completely different from a secular worldview. A view that has a, uh, its understanding in anything goes. <laughs> we know that the two are polar opposites. And this book is a book about perspective. The narrative of the preacher or the teacher reveal, reveals the depression that inevitably results from seeking happiness in worldly things. That's what you see throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Searching. <laughs> Throughout everything you could do in the world, every activity, and finding that in and of itself, it's futile. So if you lived your life based on, man, I find enjoyment and I get my joy from watching the 49ers win. Man, you're probably a miserable person. Because they didn't do too good against the Eagles. (laughs) They said, don't mess with Rocky's statue. Look what happened. They put that Niner jersey on that Rocky statue and they got whooped up. They left shivering, beat up, bruised, and broken down. So 49ers ain't cutting it. (laughs) If you find your enjoyment and fulfillment in your life based on currency and having a whole lot of money, what do you do when you don't have money? Because life is so fickle. We could say, oh man, I'm planning this trip to London and I'm setting aside all this money. Then all of a sudden, two months later, you lose your job. And now you can barely, you can't even pay for your trip. <laughs> so where's your, where's your joy? Where's your enjoyment? Where's your security? That, that's what the book is all about. It's talking about the worldly pursuits in and of themselves are futile. And they don't provide us with what we truly need as human beings. And it's depressing. <laughs> it's depressing when you try to find your fulfillment in things that are so futile. You see, this book gives Christians a chance to see the world through the eyes of a person who, though very wise. Remember, Solomon was the wisest person to ever walk the face of the earth other than Jesus Christ himself. This book gives us the perspective of looking through his lens and trying to find meaning in temporary human things. Because he shares his experiences with us in the book of Ecclesiastes. He, sh- he, does, he, he, he withholds nothing. He shares everything of what he pursued. And what, was, what, what did he come to the conclusion of? You see, this is something that many people can relate to. Because all people are searching for meaning and purpose. And, I, and, and it was interesting because this week I had a, a, a talk with one of my coworkers. And, you know... Affirmation is a big thing in our culture right now. Affirmation. And sometimes I, I'm so quick to just, to just kind of shut it down. I'm like, I don't want to hear it. But then the Lord showed me that I have to be aware that there are bits and pieces of truth in things the world has to say. It's just it's skewed and it's not biblical. Because what I've come to understand this week is that, yes, all human beings do need to be affirmed. We do need affirmation. The point is, we need affirmation in Christ alone. That's where the church and the culture greatly differ. The culture is saying, find your affirmation in, in oh, your, your, your race, in your class, 
in your sex, be whatever you want to be. But no, the Bible says you are affirmed in Jesus alone, that when he becomes who you identify with as the source of who your life is, then you are full of life and you're free to live, to serve and honor him and be a blessing to him and to other people. So we need affirmation. But affirmation will never come from seeking the things or the people of this world. Again, like I said, all people are in search of meaning and purpose. But it's not until we respond to Father God's drawing us to himself through the means of his son, Jesus Christ, that we can actually realize the meaning and the purpose for our lives. You see, your identity is not wrapped up in your title at work. I'm a skills trainer. That's what I'm called at work. That's not my identity. It's not, that's just something I do. It's one of the things I do. My identity is not pastor. I don't, it's not that I'm ashamed and I don't like telling people I'm a pastor, but I'm not trying to, I don't want to come off as someone who's bragging or coming off like I'm trying to be super spiritual. It's like I'm keeping, you know, <laughs> pastor is just another thing I do. You know, I'm a husband, but that's not my identity. That's just another thing. It's another hat I wear. I don't, I'm an earthly father to two children, but that's, that's not my identity. My identity is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. I'm a child of God, Amen. first and foremost. And because I'm affirmed in him, I'm not bogged down by all these other things. I don't, I'm, I'm, at the end of the day, I, I told you guys a long time ago. I don't ask anybody how the sermon goes anymore. I don't ever ask my wife. I asked my wife one time, how did the message go? And she knows I'm telling the truth. She can open the door. <laughs> that was, I, I asked one time, that's it. Because it's not about trying to affirm myself and what anybody else thinks. I, I'm more concerned about, Lord, what do you think about what I'm doing? How do you think, what do you say about how I'm, 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 I'm you know, v- using my time and the resources you've given to me? That is what is supposed to be the most important thing in our life is what does the Lord say about us and how does he view what we're doing and how we're using what he's given to us. You see, most every form of worldly pleasure, King Solomon, the preacher, he, he explored and he tried to find a sense of meaning in it. It's very interesting because the Bible is clear that it's not a sin to be rich. Many times you hear people harping on the rich. Oh, the rich this, the rich that, and it's so, so their fault. But, you know, many were wealthy in, in Bible times. It's not a bad thing. Think about our forefather Abraham. <laughs> It's very, he, at the time, he was the wealthiest man ever to, to, to walk the face of the earth. He had plenty of wealth. Think of Job. He was extremely wealthy, <laughs> you know? And even when all of that was, was taken away and stripped away because of uh, the favor of God upon his life and, and, and Job remaining faithful to the Lord despite the Lord taking away, it was given back to him tenfold. <laughs> he still received later on. And he was still wealthy by the world's standards. King David was a very wealthy man as he walked the face of the earth. And, and, and obviously King Solomon as well, very wealthy by worldly standards. And there's so many, we can spend an hour talking about all the, the people who had wealth and influence in biblical times. But these are just a few to name. So there's nothing wrong with having wealth. There's nothing wrong. It's not a sin to be rich. Check these these facts about the Bible, this is pretty cool. There are over, or there are about 500 verses that speak about faith in the Bible. 500. There are about 500 that, that speak to the importance of prayer and your prayer life and, 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 and what you devote your time to. But there are, there are 2,000 verses that speak about money, wealth, and possessions. 2,000! 16 out of the 30 parables that Jesus Christ taught about in the Bible have to do with the use of money. 10% of all the verses in the four Gospels of the New Testament talk about 
money. The Lord knows that money and possessions will always compete for our attention. And so he warns against such things taking place in our lives. You know, the great adversary, you know, Satan, yeah, whatever. But remember, Satan's a created being. Money and, and wealth can pose just as much of a, a problem when it comes to people's devotion to God, more so than Satan himself. Many people are driven away from the Lord or drawn away from, from a relationship with him because they want to pursue more. Uh, what's the many excuse why people don't come to service on Sunday? Oh, I got to work. You got to work. I get it. Everybody's got to work. We earn our keep by the sweat of our brow. But when you're chasing after money, you're constantly chasing and chasing and chasing. If you put Jesus Christ first as the number one priority of your life, he will always provide you what you need. You see, but it's the unhealthy desire within us to think we need more. And we're not putting him first. We're not trusting in him, but rather we're trusting in our bank account. And we think if only I had so much money, I'd be well off. If I only won the lottery, oh, I'd be well. Do you know that there's so many millionaires from years way back? And I don't have the, the quotes. I should have wrote, written them down, but you can look it up. Just Google it. Millionaires who spoke about misery. <laughs> and they talk about it. They talk about, you know... You know, going to bed with $200 million is stressful. Henry Ford said he was happier when he was a mechanic than when he became this big icon and this owner of this huge corporation. So many men who have lived and died that were extremely wealthy all say the same thing. The stress, the anxiety, the difficulty of having wealth. And then the people that don't have it, many of us think that if we just had more, that we would be fulfilled. And that's such a lie from the pit of hell. The Apostle Paul got it correct. He learned to be content in much, but he learned also to be content in little. Because his focus and his aim and his goal was Jesus Christ and doing the work of the Father. That's what was his purpose, not money. Do you know, church, you don't even have to pray about money. You don't have to pray, Lord, bless me with the money. Why does the Bible say, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will be added on? But how many times are we praying about money? Why? Because we're spiritually illiterate and we're not in the word the way we should. And we're not seeking the Holy Spirit to give us revelation and give us understanding so that we can discern the word and know what we're supposed to be seeking. Don't seek the material items. Seek Christ alone. And then he will provide for you everything you need. And, you'll, and you won't have the stress that goes along with it. But when you seek the material things, you'll never have enough. And you'll be stressed out about what you have. We're all searching for a stress-free life. And the answers are right here in Scripture. Our exceedingly great reward, church, is Jesus. Is having a relationship with Him unhindered from the sin of our heart and unhindered from the sin of the world. That's the reward. That's what we're supposed to be pursuing and seeking. But so many times in the church, we're seeking other stuff. It's not about, oh, I'm doing this in ministry. I don't care about that. Yeah, that's cool. But that's not the goal. That's not the aim. The aim is to be like Mary and sit at Jesus' feet. Well, Martha's so busybody trying to do all this stuff. And even though she had good intentions, she was wrong in her thinking. Church, we need to be like Mary and sit at the feet of Jesus. When he becomes enough, you're liberated from the cares of this world. As long as you're looking to everything else and he's not fulfilling every single need in your heart, then you're always going to be stressed out. Don't live like that, church. I'm big on examples. I'm big on tangible examples that we can see. 
and touch and taste. So it, 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 it brings it to life more. So I'm, I'm going to share this example. This is a quote from uh, from an article that was written not too long ago. And it, it goes on to say, from the outside looking in, the young anger, uh, the young actor, Angus T. Jones, appeared to have it all. One of the highest paid child actors as the little boy from Two and a Half Men. He was setting the ground for major Hollywood success. But the child star grew distant from the show once his faith began to transform. In a 2012 YouTube clip, he called the show filth and abandoned the show, saying that he felt as if he was being paid to be a hypocrite and it was difficult being part of something that was making light of topics in the world that were problems for many people. He left fame behind to work with the World Harvest Outreach Church in Houston, Texas, and feels a stronger sense of purpose since he moved closer to Christ. That's just like Solomon. This young boy was getting paid bucks, man. He was, he was a childhood star. Hollywood, what people aspire to be. Oh, I want my name in the I want my name to be on that Hollywood Walk of Fame. So many people are seeking the attention of the world. Why do we spend so much time on Instagram, on Snapchat, on YouTube, on Facebook? Those aren't your friends. Oh man, I got all these followers. Man, Christ is the one who has all the followers, all these people. I want to be an influencer. That's the whole thing in this generation. Who are you influencing? For what? You're influencing a bunch of people to go to hell? And look pretty doing it? And doing dumb stuff doing it? This young man was living that life and saw through the facade because the Lord had woken up his soul. And he chose to walk away. Not many in that position can. Think about the rich young ruler. He told Jesus, I've done everything perfectly to the T. And to what Jesus said, he didn't say he didn't. It's like, oh, he, you're following the commandments. But what did Jesus tell him? You're very rich. You're very wealthy. Take everything you have, sell it to the poor and come follow me. What that meant was the material things had his heart. Some people take that out of context and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go sell my house and I'm going to I'm going to Zimbabwe. That's not the context. We have to understand the context is that young man, the things of this world captivated his heart. And Jesus knew that. So Jesus told him, sell it all. And come follow me, and then you'll be free, then you'll be liberated, then you'll be righteous, then you'll be holy, then you'll be set apart. But what happened to that young man? He walked away bitterly because he could not part from that which had control of his innermost being. Today, where are you? Where am I? What has control of your innermost being? Is it the stuff? Is it the pursuit to think that you're going to live out some kind of so-called American dream and be able to kick your feet up and live lavished? Or, or does Christ have your heart that you want every ounce of your being to be poor? We just sang about it. We sang that we're poured out, that we're gracefully broken. Michelle just talked about it. She said, am I really gracefully broken before the Lord? This may be a heavy message, but my responsibility as a pastor is to make comfortable people uncomfortable and to make uncomfortable people comfortable in the spirit. So don't shoot the messenger <laughs> because what I'm preaching to you, I've already been going through it all week. So I, it's been preached to me. Trust me. I don't share anything with you that I have not gone through myself. Preach it, brother. Preach it. <laughs> In the end, the preacher, speaking of Solomon, comes to accept that faith in God is the only way to find personal meaning. That's it. Everything else is a mirage. You see, he decides to accept the fact that life is brief and ultimately worthless without God. Worthless without a true relationship with the Messiah. Being reconciled to God the Father, life is worthless. It's meaningless. But with him, you can find all the meaning that you'll ever need. 
The preacher advises the reader to focus on an eternal God instead of temporary pleasure. And I think for, for many of us, I know for myself growing up, especially as I hit adolescence and into my young adulthood, that was such a struggle because it's all, it was always about gratifying my flesh, gratifying myself, and, and, and then having the audacity, audacity to believe that I was entitled to gratify myself. You see, that's what I see so much in the world today. People don't care about other people because they feel entitled So what? That's his problem. That's her problem. They put themselves in that position. I got to get mine is what many people say. I'm getting mine. I'm doing me. Uh, You can do you. You you know, the Bible talks about, you know, back in the day in ancient times, the people, the owners of animals, they, they would force feed the animal. They would allow the animal to gorge on the food. Why? They were fattening up the animal for the day of slaughter. <laughs> and the animal, because it, it, it senses are carnal <clears throat> by nature, they were all about gorging themselves. They're like, you're going to give me more food? Let me gorge myself. This is great. Unbeknownst to the fact that they were fattening themselves up for the slaughter. <laughs> to be killed. They had no idea. And many people today are Feeding their senses and feeding their senses. People say, do whatever feels good. That's the motto of, that's a slogan. The, whatever feels good, do it. That's demonic and satanic by nature. Do not allow your life to be governed by your senses. Because when you do, you're simply just like that animal. You're fattening yourself up for the slaughter. The main point of this book is this. There is such a necessity for the fear of God in our lives. That's what the author came to the conclusion of. <laughs> in the end of any, everything, we need to fear God. And the world will tell you, oh, just have a reverence for God. Just respect God. You don't have to fear. No, we, we need to have a holy fear of who God is. Now, again, without the, the unveiling of the Holy Spirit and helping us unpack this and understand it, people aren't going to get it. They're going to say, I, I thought God was love. Why are you telling you Now you're confusing me. You're telling me to fear God. No, no, no. <laughs> Just as a child should have a healthy fear of their parent, because the parent is the one physically that brought them into the world. Speaking of the mother, there should be a healthy fear there. We are not our own creator. We are the creation. We should have a healthy fear of God. Look at the Old Testament, man. When, 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 when people came in contact with the heavenly host or with the angel of the Lord, what did they do? They didn't sit there talking back. They fell on their face, man. They got on their knees as a sign of reverence and respect to a holy and omnipotent God. And then that's how the posture of your character of your life should be. Because the fear of the Lord keeps you from sinning. But when we don't have a healthy fear of God, we feel like we can do whatever we want and we can get away with it. And the worst thing, we'd be like the first Adam thinking we can hide. <laughs> I'm just going to sew some fig leaves together. I go did my dirty business. Now I'm sewing my fig leaves together and I'm going to hide up in this world thinking God don't see every single thing I'm doing. He knows good and well what you did last night, what I did last night, what you did in the morning, what I did in the morning before I got here. He knows it all. And and I'm I'm not sharing that to shame you. I'm sharing that to encourage you. God, we're always before God. Again, integrity is what we do when no one's looking. So if we have a healthy fear of God, it's going to keep us on the straight and narrow. You see... Each human being wants to understand all the ways of God and how he's calling us to live in this world, but we can't because we're not God. And yet the faithful do not despise this, but they cling to God even when they cannot see what God is doing. How many, how many of you have been through something this week where you went through a situation in a circumstance where you're like, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why this is happening. <laughs> But yet you cling to God and you trust that God has a plan in it. 
And that's not the easiest thing to do. I get it, church. But but but, but we have to we have to we have to come to a place where where we use our will to cling to God. Because the will is a strong thing. And it's a it's it's very powerful if we use it for good. And I believe that's what we're, we've been given a will for as human beings, to cling to God. Because like I said at the beginning of this message, love is not this just mushy feeling. And, and, and oh yeah, I only choose to love when I'm being loved back, or I'm only choosing to love when it's convenient. It's like many times love is, you got to love when it's inconvenient. <laughs> Loving inconvenient, loving in inconvenient times, loving inconvenient people, loving people who don't love you back the way you feel like you should be loved. But that's what biblical love is all about. And the more you and I live like that, the more you and I are becoming transformed into the person and likeness of Christ himself. You see. The Lord deserves his people's trust. We can leave everything to him while we seek to understand what it means to fear God and keep his commandments. This church is true wisdom. So there are some key themes, and I want to go through this with the remainder of our time about the book of Ecclesiastes. And the first key theme is this, the tragic reality of the fall, the fall of mankind. You see, the preacher is painfully aware that the creation has been damaged by sin, and he speaks as one who eagerly awaits the resurrection age. Romans chapter 8 verses 20 through 22 tells us, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. You see, all these things, people ask, well, why, why, is, why does all this stuff happen, man? Why, do, why, why does all this struggle happen and all this pain happen? And it's because of sin. This is the consequence of going against God. This is the consequence of going our own way, thinking we know better, thinking we can live however we want and, 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 and not uphold the standards that God has set forth. And these are the consequences. So, yes, I, I'm, you know, I'm grateful that I wasn't created a woman because I don't have to ever endure those trials of childbearing. But that's why women go through pain. I mean, if Adam and Eve never sinned, I mean, women would probably have babies and they wouldn't even feel no pain. It would just happen. <laughs> you wouldn't have to get an epidural. You wouldn't have to go through all that feeling, all that pain. But that's part of the, uh, the corruption of sin. Even physical death. Who knows? We probably wouldn't even have gray hair. You probably wouldn't even wrinkle. Wouldn't need no Olay. You know, Jennifer Gardner would still look 20 years old. (laughs) All that good stuff. You know, you wouldn't age, man. You know, Tony Bennett just passed, right? 96 years old. You probably wouldn't have passed. You just live forever because in this state, because it would have been perfect. It would it would have been unhindered untouched by sin but sin marred everything and some people have the audacity to say well if i was that person back then i wouldn't have just stopped of course you would of course i would have you know we're all we're all our natural inclination is bent towards selfishness greed and doing what we want to do and putting our needs before everyone else just keep it real that's that's how we are. When I get home from service after a long day of serving, I'm like, you think I want to serve? <laughs> I want to chill, man. <laughs> and my wife is busting her butt still. She, 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 she has such a good heart. And I know it's not her. It's the Lord. But I'm so grateful for her because she don't gripe. She don't complain. I'm the one complain. I'm like, man, I'm tired, man. <laughs> I don't want to do nothing. I'm like, Tears, I'm like, Tears, get off me, man. Stop, stop, get your feet off me, girl. I need my space. It's too hot. You know, but, but that's not the Lord, right? But that's our natural inclination. We, 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 we do this. And that, that's what Solomon came to understand. He's like, man, this, this is the predicament that all human beings fall into being born into this world because of sin. And so that was, that, that's the first main theme that we see. Don't worry, it's going to get better. <laughs> but that's the first. Uh, just, I got to keep it real. I cannot bend and, 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 and contort the word of God. I got to share with you what, uh, what the Lord shows me as the raw, uncut. 
The second, the second main theme is this. The vanity of life. That's why I like that slide. If you notice, there's a bunch of diamonds around that mirror. Something like probably Mariah Carey or Beyonce would use. It's, you know, probably like $18,000 <laughs> mirror. But the vanity of life. The book begins and ends with the exclamation, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2 says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Again, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 8 says it again. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities with the exclamation point. So he's driving. He's trying to drive it home. Now this, is, this, is, <laughs> this is what I see in life. It's all vain. All is vanity. We know, we know what being vain is, right? You know, vanity, man. Like, you know, how many of you, when you go past the mirror, look. <laughs> I'm guilty. I ain't going to lie. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Even if it's not a mirror and it's just like a reflection, I'm like, man, I'm like tempted to <laughs> just look. It's vain, man. It's vanity. Just walk by, man. Why you got to look again? I heard this one uh, message from Tony Evans. I won't get into it, but he's talking about, man, this is crazy. He said, you know, uh, and, and it's not putting women under the bus, but he was talking about women. And he was talking about how, man, you got the, you got the mirror in the bathroom. <laughs> then you got the vanity. Then you got the, the full on mirror. That's the full body mirror. Then you go into the car and you got the, the mirror right there in rear view still checking. And then in your purse, you got the compact mirror. <laughs> You're like, oh, holy vanity. How many mirrors do you need, man? <laughs> Vanity, vanity. You see, the phrase pictures something fleeting and elusive. All the endeavors and pleasures of earthly life are only temporary at best. No matter how hard human beings try to satisfy themselves with the pleasures of this life, only Jesus, the Messiah, satisfies. I mean, we could try so hard. Sometimes it's food. And it's like, oh, I just, man, I, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying stuff. We'll get to that in a minute. But whatever it is, you fill in the blank. But we as human beings, we're always tempted to try to fulfill ourselves with something other than Christ. And, and, and Solomon came to understand that all of earthly life and its pleasures are only temporary at best. You see, when one sees the consequences of sin in this fallen world, one is left to utter frustration, anger, and sorrow. That's the predicament of the human being. That's if we come to that point. You know that some people haven't even come to that point? They're they're not even ready to recognize that this is a fallen world, that they're a born sinner, that their natural inclination is always towards selfishness. They're not even there. But for those who are on their way to being saved and those of us that are already saved, we've gotten to that point. We've come to realize, man, (laughs) this life is frustrating and it makes me angry. And then I'm filled with sorrow because this predicament, I mean, wow, what gives? (laughs) The more one tries to understand life, the more mysterious it becomes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 Uh, Chapter 1, verse 12 down through 18 speaks about this, and I'll read it. It says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassed all who ever were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this this is also is but a striving after the wind, for in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Wow, that's crazy. (laughs) He who increases knowledge increases sorrow, because the more you learn, the more you realize, man, the depravity of life. And your only hope is Jesus. The third theme of this book is sin and death. Trust me, it's going to get better. (laughs) 
you, you got to go through the nasty and the ugly before you get to the good. It just doesn't work the other way. You, you got to know what you're up against and what the problem is before you can get the solution to the problem. It's like the doctor at the doctor's office. They got to administer things that are uncomfortable that we don't like. But in the end, the hope is that it's going to get better. But we know spiritually for sure when we go through the bad and the ugly, it is going to be better because we're working with the great physician, not an earthly, worldly one. But the next theme is this, sin and death. By missing the mark in sinning, human beings forfeited the righteousness they originally had before God. We talked about this a minute ago. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 29 tells us, See this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Wow, God made us upright, meaning he made us perfect. Man, he fashioned us in such a way that we lack nothing. But what do we do? Oh, it's so sad. We sought after schemes. <laughs> he, he created us in, perfect, in, in perfection. We're perfectly and fearfully and wonderfully created, yet we sought out after schemes. And then we caused this upon ourselves. I see it every day with my children. It's like, you guys, you know what's the right thing to do. Make the wise choice. When you guys make the wrong choice, you suffer. You're causing yourself to suffer. My daughter over here having a conniption fit and having a, a breakdown over here this morning before service. I'm like, what are you doing, girl? Your stomach hurts because you're stressing yourself out. Stop crying. Breathe. I already prayed for you. Breathe in. Slow. Out. Deep. You'll be okay. But just like this verse said, she was created perfect and upright. But because she followed after some scheme in her mind... Remember, the mind is the battlefield of Satan. <laughs> and now she's over here suffering. And this is the thing. Originally, again, Yahweh created Adam and Eve. Humanity was perfect, complete, without blemish. It wasn't in, until they decided to follow after their desires of their own hearts and go against God's authority that sin entered their hearts. And thus, now all people are sinners. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20 tells us, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. That's why we say, we have the phrase in Christianity, uh, I, I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Because I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm not righteous. Trust me, if you spend a day with me, you'd realize your pastor's not righteous. <laughs> I have the imputed righteousness of Christ upon my life, but I have no righteousness of my own and neither do you. Death was a result of the fall. You see, the preacher is only too aware of this dreadful reality that affects everyone. That's why, you know, as, especially as married couples, we've got to give each other grace. <laughs> Wives, don't look for your husband to be perfect. And I'm not saying allow him to be a slouch. <laughs> but know that he's never going to fulfill e everything, all your expectations. And husbands, don't look to your wives to fulfill all your expectations. Keep Christ as the center. Keep Christ as the glue. Keep Christ as the one that will never let you down, never forsake you. And you'll be good and you'll give more grace to one another and your, and your marriage will flourish more and more. Because trust me, man, you're going to sin against one another. It's just the nature that we have. You know, it may not be in big things, but don't let the little foxes spoil the vineyard is what is what the is what the Song of Solomon Song of Songs says. Don't let those little things fester up. We got to give grace. Got to be like willing to say, you know what? Come on, man, that's not worth fighting over. <laughs> Let's not major on the minors, man, because then you have an unhappy marriage. You're always like, man, I'm walking on eggshells. I can't believe this person. I married the wrong person. I can't believe what I'm stuck in this marriage. I got four kids. I'm like, I can't do nothing. <laughs> right? But, that, but that's what happens when we're not focused on Christ, man. We start going all these crazy places because we're starting to follow after schemes. <laughs> Don't let yourself allow to be led down that rabbit hole. The application is this. The closer you and I are drawn into the presence of God, the more... We realize how holy he is and how wretched you and I truly are. But the, but the good thing is, again, despite him seeing us that way, he says, daughter, son, come to me. I'm drawing you to me so I can so he can clean you up so he can make you whole so he can make you full of his love and his light. And now the thing is, now you just got to walk with him. And don't kick against the goads and don't go back to that former way of life. You see, some of us, we have such a problem because we've already been cleansed. But yet we keep going back to the pig pen. We're going back to the vomit. You've been delivered. Why are you going back to that? 
you're still convinced that that kind of life can satisfy you. So you're watching things that you shouldn't watch. You're being in illicit relationships you shouldn't be in. You're tampering with things like drugs and alcohol you shouldn't tamper with because you think it's going to give you satisfaction. Again, you're following after myths instead of trusting that Jesus alone is the only one that can fulfill you. Your life will never be satisfied apart from him. But this is something you have to experience for yourself. I can tell you till I'm blue in the face. Well, actually... I'm probably not going to turn blue because I'm dark. But I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I can speak to you till I'm sweating out every, every ounce of whatever liquid in my body. And that's not going to do any good until you personally apply this to yourself and you test God. Not meaning in a mocking, condescending way, but saying, put his promises to the test. If you keep on striking out, but you're not giving your full effort, well, no wonder why you're striking out because you haven't, you haven't applied the principles of the word to your life for real, for real. <laughs> you got to sell all out to Christ before you can reap the benefits of a relationship with Jesus. If you're one foot in the church and one foot in the world, no wonder why you got chaos going on in your life because you haven't dedicated yourself. Trust me, I've been there. I've done that. It doesn't work. <laughs> it only works these are, the, these are the promises that are conditional. The condition is all in. When you're all in, then it's going to flow. Even with the craziness of this world, even with the consequences that are going to come in your life that you're not going to like, you're still going to have joy. You're still going to have peace. You're still going to have favor. You're still going to have his anointing. You're going to rise above every circumstance because you're more than a conqueror in Christ. You're not just going to get by by the skin of your teeth. You are a victor in Christ. But if you're not aware of your status and your stature in Jesus, then that's why you suffer. Don't be like that. It, 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 it's a burden to my heart to see people that are in Christ and they're suffering, not like Job, but they're suffering because of their own doing. And my heart goes out to them. And I get so mad at my own sin when I get caught up like that. I'm like, no, that's so dumb. Don't do that. (laughs) You are a conqueror in Christ. More than a conqueror. We have two more. And we'll start beginning to wrap it down. This is the fourth main theme of this book. Okay, it starts to get better. (laughs) The joy and the frustration of work. You see, God gave Adam work to accomplish prior to the fall. But part of the punishment of his sin was that his work would become difficult. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 tells us, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to keep it, or some translations say to till the ground, to till it, to keep it. Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 through 19 tells us, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, And have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. I think it's self-explanatory. We see why 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 is hard, why is work difficult? Why is work tiresome? Why why do we come home from a forty hour work week and we're like, leave me alone? <laughs> Give me like thirty minutes in my easy boy chair and let me just chill. <laughs> I need to just relax. Why? It's because of the fall. Work was such a good thing before the fall. I don't even think Adam broke a sweat. <laughs> he wasn't perspiring. He didn't, need, he didn't need the Old Spice Man. I can't even whistle, but if I whistle, I would do their little jingle. They didn't need that. No, he didn't need that. There was no reason for it. But now we have all this stuff. Got to have dry fit shirts and this and that. And na, 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 na. <laughs> Why? Because we got to work hard, man. Because it's, 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 it's part of the curse of the fall. But we are to enjoy our work. And I'll get into what that looks like after, after this. Here it is in verse 5. The grateful enjoyment of God's good gifts. That's the fifth main theme of the book of Ecclesiastes. 
the grateful enjoyment. Don't we want to enjoy? We do want to enjoy. But let's enjoy the good gifts of God, his way. You see, the preacher spends a great deal of time commenting on the twisted realities of a fallen world. But this does not blind him to the beauty of God's world. That's the difference between someone who's kept in Christ and someone who's aloof and someone who has just, they're not there. They're spiritually blinded. Because, again, he sees the twisted realities of this fallen world. But he doesn't let that tarnish his soul. He doesn't let that tarnish his spirit. He's not blind to the beauty of God's world. Some people become so jaded when they hear of the, the you know, the, the, the whatever, the baby being molested, the, the same sex marriage, or the, well, now that you just being, I don't know, they're creating all kind of stuff. You don't even have to be a sex anymore. Uh, the mass shootings, people getting killed, gunned down everywhere in every part of the world all the time. Uh, you know, priests molesting people and doing, I mean, just stuff that's just bonkers. And the people that are not grounded and rooted in Christ, they, they, they hear these things in the news. The wildfires, the tornadoes, the fact that the water's been, it's been the hottest it's ever been since they ever recorded the heat since, uh, you know, beginning of, they, they did that in July, this, what, July 4th. All this stuff, all the crazy things in the world. It, it, it gets people who are, not, who are not grounded in Christ, they just lose it. And they literally go postal. This is why you need Jesus. Because the things of this world will drive you mad. But as Solomon saw in his day and age, he was grounded and rooted in Yahweh, in the God of all creation. And it kept him with the proper perspective. And he was able to enjoy the gifts of God despite the frailties of this life. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 tells us, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. The application is this. The difficulties of this life does not cause Solomon to despise God's good gifts of human relationship, food, drink, and satisfying labor. These things are to be received humbly and enjoyed fully as blessings from God. So if you have a family... No matter how big or how small, embrace them. Praise God for the fellowship you have with your family. Even, even the disputes that, that every family, every family is dysfunctional. <laughs> no family is perfect. But be a blessing. Blessed are those who have those around them that they can call upon, that they can love on. If you, if you have, if you have a, a hot meal or a cool meal in the summertime prepared for you, praise God for the nice meal that you have to refresh your body. Thank God for the drink that you have and rejoice in the Lord that he's prepared these things for you to enjoy. These are blessings from God. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 18 tells us, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. The few days of his life that God has given him for this is his lot. That's your lot. Enjoy it. Don't, don't complain about your work. I know it's tempting. It's tempting to bicker and complain and, 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 be, and be seduced by, by that unclean spirit where you have other co-workers and they're coming around you talking negatively about people or about situations. It's easy to get sucked into that. Don't allow it. Don't allow the gossip train to get you on and get you caught up. You need to stand aside and be like, no. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not going to let you rob and steal me of my joy. I'm here working hard as unto the Lord. And I'm not going to judge people. And I'm not going to be bickering and complaining. I'm going to do my job the way I'm supposed to. And I'm going to clock in and clock out. And I'm going to go enjoy my family. The last main theme of this book is the fear of the Lord. As I begin to start winding this, this message down. The fact that all is vanity should drive you and I to take refuge in Father God alone, fearing and revering Him. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 12 and 13 tells us, Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those 
who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. I mean, it's, again, it, these things are self-explanatory. The Bible makes it crystal clear how we should engage in our relationship with the Lord. The application is this. You see, fearing God puts us in the correct alignment with him. Have you driven a car when your alignment's off? <laughs> You're like, does this thing have power steering or not? Because I keep swerving to the right side when I'm keeping the, my wheel straight. It's because your alignment's off. You got to take it in. They got to do what they got to do. Recalibrate those wheels. And then you're going out and you're straight. You're the way you're supposed to. When we fear God, when we have a holy fear of him, we're in right alignment. And our life works right. We see correctly. We see not dimly, but we see lit up. Our vision is clear. When, but we have to have a fear of him. You see, when we fear God with a holy and righteous fear, Father God pours out his grace, mercy, and love upon us. We need a healthy fear of God. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. You don't have to keep yourself. He's going to keep you. You just have to submit. <laughs> I just have to submit and, and acknowledge I don't have it all figured out and that you're the creator and I'm not. So because you're the creator and I'm not, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bow down to you. I mean, I see it all the time in sports. Someone does good on the basketball court and they're bowing down. I know it's just a sign. They, they're not literally trying to say they worship. But, but, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and then our body follows. Why would, why would, be, why would we be so quick to, to praise a human being? But yet we have no reverent fear of God. We have no holy fear of him. You see, it's very interesting. Even Jesus Christ, the son, has a holy fear of Father God. That is not blasphemous at all. That is completely biblical. You see, demonic fear paralyzes, right? That fear where, oh, I, I don't want to go out. That's what happened during the pandemic. Oh, I can't go nowhere. We had, we had to struggle through that, you know, and I get it. But, you know, it's like, that's what we opened up. We're like, we're opening it up. We're taking off the mask. <laughs> we, try to, we try to honor Santa Clara County as much as we could. And it got to the point, you know what? I'm not fearing this. This is a demonic fear, you know? We're not, we're not to be foolish, but at the same time, I'm not going to live. I'm not going to live my life paralyzed by fear over some virus. I'm going to die when I'm going to die. I'm going to honor the Lord before I honor Santa Clara County. But the fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. Demonic fear paralyzes, but the fear of the Lord brings us into freedom from the power of darkness. That's why we should have a healthy, holy fear of God. Because we get freed, we get liberated from the powers of darkness. If you're, if you're, if you're scared of dark things of this world, of demonic spiritual things, that means you're not fearing God. <laughs> because the demons tremble at the name of Christ. And if you're a Christian, if you're a true, a true born-again follower of Christ, then Christ in you will make those demons fear and tremble at the sound of his voice. You tread on them. You're not scared of them in the name of Jesus. And that's all that needs to be done. I just get so pumped up about this because it's so real and, and I don't want to see people bound, bound, struggling when they don't have to. Matthew chapter 10, 28, and, and Michelle and Isaiah, they can come up. I'm, I'm, I'm going to shut my mouth in a minute here. Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The whole point is to fear the Lord because when we do, he becomes our reward. <laughs> the Bible tells us in John chapter 17, verse 3, And this is eternal life 
that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You see, the greatest reward is to have our soul satisfied by truly knowing who God is. This is a deep abiding peace that only comes from divine revelation of who Jesus Christ is, not merely intellectual. This is something that cannot be manufactured. It's not about church attendance. It's not about keeping tabs on, oh, I've read the Bible X amount of days and so I'm good. No, those things are good, but that's not it. We miss the point when we're not seeking him. Because the rituals and the traditions, those, that's, that's not what he's after. He's after your heart. He's after my heart. This cannot happen unless we develop through the power of holy conviction, a holy fear of God. When we truly fear him, he will bring us into alignment with himself. When this happens, we'll truly know that we're loved, that we're embraced, and that we're safe. The fear will fall off. You won't have to keep thinking about what you don't, what you're not supposed to do. You won't focus on what you're not supposed to do. You'll just do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> just do it. Stop talking about what you don't want to do. Start doing what you need to do. But that only comes when you have a true, holy fear of God. You see, we will be confident in Yahweh when this happens. And then and only then will we truly be happy. Remember, Jesus said, he who believes in me from his inner being will flow rivers of living water. This is more filling than anything the world can offer us. Amen? Let's pray. Abba, Father, thank you for just the revelation of your word. The revelation of you revealing yourself to us, showing us who you truly are and who we are in you. Thank you that you pursue us all the days of our lives that your desire is to have unhindered fellowship with us. Lord, would you cause us to open the door of our hearts and to invite you in? May you be the only one who sits on the throne of our hearts. May we eradicate everything that's competing for your attention. There's nothing else that can ever satisfy us but you. Lord, bring us into proper alignment. Bless us with the holy fear of who you are so that we may throw aside anything that's being an extra weight and may we walk in newness of life today. Father, I praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness. May the just walk by faith and not by sight. We thank you and we love you. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus Christ's precious name that I pray. Amen.